This is Selma Schimmel for the group room at the Community Oncology Alliance COA meeting in Las Vegas. And I'm joined right now by Dr. Robert Herman, Northwest Georgia Oncology Centers in Atlanta, Georgia. You're the Vice President of the Community Oncology Alliance and the Oncology Medical Director for Wellstar Health System. Welcome. Thank you. And I know we're going to talk about quality and clinical trials in the community setting. But before we talk about that, maybe in your multiple roles here, both with the COA, which is the Community Oncology Alliance, you may want to say a few words about the significance of what it means to have a meeting like this where you bring together practitioners from across the country. Well, I think this meeting is multifaceted. Um, and it's really, there's a core group of community oncology practices that helped uh, found the uh, Community Oncology Alliance uh, that come together uh, annually to share ideas in patient care um, and uh, advance patient care uh, for cancer patients throughout the United States. I'm really looking forward to discussing with you your topic regarding quality and clinical trials within this setting because there's often the feeling that if you're in the private sector, you may not be able to access clinical trials. And indeed, you can. And there's fantastic collaborations that can happen also between the private practice and the academic centers. So talk to me about your vision. 80% of cancer patients are treated in the community. Uh, there has been widespread adoption of advanced cancer treatment technologies that are available in the community setting. Uh, and yet, you know, obviously our uh, treatment of cancer is still not perfect. Uh, so there is definitely a place for clinical trials in the community. Uh, that's where the majority of patients are. Uh, and uh, in order to advance our science, we need access uh, to those patients. Uh, in addition, as I mentioned, uh, uh, I think it takes a quality practice to be able to deliver clinical trials and offer those options uh, to their patients. With the early stage clinical trials, are you able to do that in the private practice or are, do trials begin first at academic centers and then after safety has been documented, then it, when it moves into higher stages, it's able to get into the private practice? So this is something that, that is an evolution at this point in time. Uh, traditionally, phase one studies, first in human studies of new uh, agents has been done in uh, academic centers. Um, but more and more with more pr uh, products being developed and community practices that have developed sophisticated clinical trials programs, uh, some of those phase one studies are able to be done in, in community settings as well. There's a great deal of paperwork and cost involved in implementing a clinical trial. Talk to us a bit about what kind of practice is really able to manage the volume of work and responsibility that a practice takes on when they do clinical trials. Certainly. It takes uh, quite a commitment and quite an infrastructure to be able to conduct uh, clinical trials these days. Uh, it's a very heavily regulated environment. Uh, you have to have committed uh, personnel. You have to have commitment of the practice, commitment of the physicians to support it. Within your setting, how a patient who has a more advanced or challenging disease, would the doctors offer clinical trial opportunities to such patients? Or is this something where patients do their research and come and say, hey, I've read about this? Or does the practice actually become proactive on the part of seeking out the clinical trial that might be appropriate for their patient? The practice has to be proactive. Um, more and more patients are aware of clinical trials. Um, and there is a small subgroup of patients that will seek specific trials. Uh, but they are generally aware that clinical trials may be an option. Uh, our physicians will discuss clinical trials with patients in the context of, of what, whatever treatment options may be available, what standard treatment options are available as well as what clinical trial options are available, uh, including uh, investigational drug uh, therapy trials. I'm wondering if in the uh, community practice, if clinical trials ever begin within a practice setting, a physician who has you know, innovative 
research mind develops a protocol? Do such things happen? Those things do happen. Um, there can be support for what's known as investigator-initiated trials. Um, uh, and uh, more and more there are networks of clinical uh, trials physicians uh, from the community that work together to be able to conduct those sorts of trials. We've been involved in several different uh, investigator-initiated trials that have been developed within uh, net community networks. Talk to us a little bit about the relationship that a community practice can have with an academic center. I think it's uh, key for a strong practice, especially a practice that has uh, a commitment to clinical trials to have an ac academic uh, partner. It, haps, it helps the academic uh, institutions. Uh, they gain a broader access to pa uh, patients to be able to be enrolled on trials that way. Uh, and it helps the practice keep in touch with uh, developments that uh, might be available. I'm glad we're talking about this because I think this is an area that patients may not understand. You know, say you live very far from the cancer center and you, you would like to be seen closer to home. It's so much easier on patients, but I don't think they realize that they can have this collaborative relationship where they're a physician. Once at least I believe it would have to be uh, a phase two or would it be a phase three study at the point where you can collaborate? Collaboration can really occur at, uh, at all levels. And uh, as I said, you know, most of the first in human type trials uh, are conducted primarily at uh, academic institutions, but there are now what we call uh, phase 1B trials. Once a, uh, a new product in development uh, has gone through that initial first in human testing, doses have been determined, it has to be combined with other agents. And uh, uh, some of the, that can be predicted uh, by uh, characteristics of what's being combined with, but you still have to do phase 1B trials where you carefully examine is there interactions of those uh, treatments that can then be developed into a phase uh, two trial or a phase three trial. So we, we conduct trials uh, phase 1B, phase two, phase three uh, in our practice. Physicians in the community setting work very, very, very hard for their patients. They have a, when you're at a cancer center and you've specialized, so you know your area would be GI medicine or you know, breast or lung, but the physician in private practice has such a huge job because they must stay on top of everything. And if they see a cross-section of patients, what an awesome academic task for physicians in the community to have to be so well-versed and to stay on top of all of now the targeted and biologic therapies that are entering into the mix of, of uh, compounds that you use to treat patients. Our practice uh, made a commitment to getting into developmental clinical trials about uh, 15 years ago when we realized there were new drugs being approved that we had never had any work with in clinical trials. Uh, traditionally, the uh, National Cancer Institute cooperative groups uh, used to have uh, trials available with investigational agents uh, prior to um, their approval. Uh, but as time has gone on with many more products in development uh, and the need to rapidly get those uh, uh, products tested and, and eventually approved, uh, many of them don't even reach the uh, cooperative group mechanism before they, they go through, uh, a, you know, uh, trials for approval. Uh, so we wanted to be able to have experience with these new medications uh, before approval. Uh, and that's an area of, I think, quality for the practice. You have to conduct it, uh, uh, the trial you know, through the protocol. You have to follow everything very carefully. Uh, there's safety nets for the patients because this is all under IRB review, uh, review by sponsors. Um, uh, uh, regulatory authority review. So there's, there's a tremendous safety net. You, you follow the protocol carefully. You learn uh, what's known about the compound in detail. Uh, you learn firsthand about what toxicities you may have to expect or manage. Uh, and then when it becomes approved, you're ahead of the game. Uh, you're, you're ready to 
utilize that in the right setting and know how to utilize it. One of the areas I have so much respect for for doctors in the community is that, you know, when you are working at an academic center, you have all of this support around you. And clinical trials and research, it's just part of, you know, the core of what a university or academic center is involved with. When you're in the private practice, these doctors work very, very, very hard for their patients, not only trying to find an appropriate trial, maybe a compassionate use outreach, maybe contacting a pharma company directly or a primary researcher investigator in the U.S., sometimes out of the U.S. And when I also think about the work that goes on in a doctor's practice, you know, to deal with insurance companies to be sure that your exams or your imaging and your labs and things that are costly get approved, I don't know if patients and their families know just how much intensive work the community doctor does on behalf of their patients. It is hard work, it's multifaceted, you've got to have a practice operation that can support you in many ways um, and let you focus on helping the patient. And that's our reward every day is, you know, we know we're helping people on a daily basis and, and uh, they're fighting for their lives. And uh, it, it's a privilege for us to be able to do what we can for them. When you report your clinical trials data back to uh, industry or the, the CROs, and do you, is all that done electronically? How do you communicate all of this data back to the research source that needs to collect the data? The clinical trials industry has historically been very paper driven, uh, but more and more is becoming electronic. Um, in most trials that we conduct now, um, our coordinators will abstract data from our database and have to enter it into an electronic database. So there's still that manual uh, conversion. We're not quite at the point where we are recording primary data that goes directly into an electronic uh, repository for the trial. It does go into our electronic record uh, for our practice uh, and uh, that's been a, a, a great uh, improvement for us to be able to monitor our patients on study, uh, but there's still a lot to be uh, to be gained, you know, with the use of electronic. Yeah, and I would imagine also that the use of, of, of language as you assess all this information, that if it's being done electronically or, you know, through digital means, that, that there has to be common language in order to interpret results. So doctors are all using different language. I guess that's a one barrier that we're going to have to overcome with technology is that language issue. Right. You know, uh, medicine historically has been very analog. It's very descriptive. And uh, for clinical trials, you need to learn how to uh, uh, make things more finite and put them in terms that, that uh, can be used repetitively. Right. And, and interpret it. Patients who are on a trial, how can they stay on top of the information that's being evaluated and um, recorded about them and being passed on? or is that not available to patients? Well, there's an overlap with clinical practice and, and uh, you know, and again, that's another reason I'm at this conference here is that we, we have to also develop our, our practice tools um, and uh, comply with uh, Medicare regulations and other regulations, uh, but uh, there is a push for standardization of medical records and there's a push for being able to ha uh, have patients have better access to their uh, medical information. So uh, in the very near future, and some pra practices have already adopted the use of portals that allow uh, the patients to view uh, certain information that's been recorded. What's your closing message that you would like patients to hear? Patients need to know that uh, advanced cancer care is available in their community. Uh, if they find a practice that does offer clinical trials as, as part of their treatment options, that that can be a mark of quality of a practice. That means that they have developed an infrastructure that ensures that they track data carefully and that they record data carefully. And it gives them extra assurance that they are getting the best therapy available. Even if they're not a candidate for the clinical trial, they can benefit from the practice that's committed to that infrastructure. Thank you, Dr. Robert Herman, Northwest Georgia Oncology Center's Vice President of the Community Oncology Alliance 
and the Oncology Medical Director for Wellstar Health System. Thanks for taking this time to speak with us. Thank you.